All right. Laura, Seth, thank you for inviting me to talk today. And I'm going to do something that's a little bit different. And, uh, and really the objective of this talk is to get you thinking about what's going on in the soil. And in this particular case, what's going in on in a pasture ecosystem in terms of nutrient cycling and, uh, <clears throat> and pasture ecology. And I, I like to give this talk because it's a little bit different than a regular uh, kind of a just a nutrient management talk where we talk about phosphorus and nitrogen management and so forth. Um, and pasture ecosystems are a little bit different than the row crop ecosystems that we were talking about earlier. So with that, if, if you ever have questions on pastures, you can always call here and ask for me. I'd be happy to talk to you. My email address is down there if you want to email me. Before I start, I just want to recognize um, that, that parts of this talk is from these two people. And this is uh, Ed Rayburn on the right. He's the um, Forge Extension Specialist at West Virginia University. Very, very good ecologist and, uh, and a very thorough understanding of, of this whole grassland ecosystem. I uh, learned a lot from him over the years. And then my graduate student, former graduate student, Ellen Arnauden. Ellen is now in New Zealand um, working at a place called the Foundation for Arable Research. And she's a um, research manager for forage crops. So we're, we're real proud of her. And she did uh, pasture ecology work here. Uh, about, I guess it's been seven or eight years ago. And um, she actually worked with dung beetles, and we'll talk about those as we, as we move on. When, when we think about sustainable forage livestock systems, there's some things that we need to talk about. And, and the first one is that what we're really in the business of is harvesting sunlight. And we're harvesting that sunlight through the plant. We're taking that sunlight and we're converting that sunlight on into um, chemical energy through photosynthesis and, and eventually into food and fiber products for people. We're using a marginal land resource in most cases when we talk about, about grazing systems. Usually the land that we have in pastures is not the best land on the farm. It's, it's land that really needs to have a permanent cover on it in most cases. And, and that allows us to use this marginal land resource to generate a, a food product. We want to protect and improve our natural resources, and we do that by maintaining cover on that ground, just like all these cover crop talks. The, the more cover we can re retain on that pasture area or on the soil, uh, the better it's going to be in the long term for that soil. So we want to do things that are going to give us a healthy and vigorous sod within that grassland ecosystem. And it's got to be profitable. You know, that's really, really important. And sometimes, you know, we, we talk about spending, Wade talked about these really complex cover crop mixtures, and that's fine. But, but are you getting back what you're putting into it? If you're putting a lot more money into it, are you getting something back for that additional dollars? Sometimes you are, sometimes you're not. But Overall, a grassland, a sustainable forage livestock system is going to be profitable. And I hedge that a little bit by saying that sometimes it's a lifestyle choice. Sometimes we get to the point where maybe we've, we've made our fortune. I haven't done that yet. But, and we come back and we want to do something else. And, and we do have retired people that's more of a lifestyle choice than, than a um, profit, profit center. So let's start out and, and talk just a little bit about what a soil is. And this is from a, a classic soils test. If you've ever had a soils class, you probably used this Brady and Weil. And, and uh, their definition in that text is a dynamic natural body composed of mineral and organic solids, gases, lipids, and living organisms, um, which can serve as a medium for plant growth. A lot of times we forget about the living part of a soil, but a healthy soil is teeming with life. And, and that's really, really important to, to, um, to remember. A lot of times we think a soil is like a chemistry set. We adjust the phosphorus and the potassium and the calcium and the magnesium and the pH. But, but a healthy soil is really full of living things. And, and that's what I want to talk a little bit 
today about pasture ecosystems and a little bit about what's in the soil and what those organisms are doing for us in terms of nutrient cycling within grassland ecosystems. So the first thing I want to mention is soil organic matter. We talk a lot about organic matter and it, it comes, there's different types of this and the soil scientists do an even better job of dividing these out. But, but I kind of divide them up here into three parts. We've got biomass, which could be like plant roots in the soil. Those are living things that are in that soil. Then we have detritus. Those are living things that have died and are kind of decomposing, but we can still kind of tell what they are. It could be plant leaves on top of the soil. It could be roots or nodules in the soil from a lagoon plant. And then we have what we have called humus, which is highly degraded um, biomass. And it, this soil organic matter plays important roles in the soil. One, it reduces bulk density of the soil. We can kind of think of it as so much like a sponge. The more the organic matter in the soil, the more spongy that soil is. So instead of setting up tight when it gets wet and then dry again, it maintains uh, some of the porosity in the soil. It, the soil organic matter is an important source of food for soil organisms, and that's very, very important to remember. Soil organisms improve soil structure and chemistry, improves uh, aeration of the soil, it improves water infiltration in the soil, it improves water retention in the soil, um, and can improve nutrient availability also um, as we increase organic matter. So organic matter is the food for all the citizens of the soil community. And these are some of the, what I call the citizens of the soil community. We've got plant roots and nodules. We've got earthworms in a healthy pasture. We've got slugs and snails. We often think of slugs and snails as bad things, things that damage our crop, and sometimes they can. But they play a vital role in this whole nutrient cycling. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. We've got nematodes and wood lice and spiders and mites and millipedes and springtails and beetles, protozoa, bacteria, fungus, all living in the soil. And they provide services. Probably one of the most important services for us that Wade was talking about is nitrogen fixation. Uh, after photosynthesis, biological nitrogen fixation is probably the second most important biochemical process on the earth. Um, they cycle nutrients. They're, we have shredders and decomposers and predators and predators of predators. Um, and they help cycle nutrients back through the system. They improve soil structure and aeration, water infiltration, water holding capacity. And, and this all feeds into what we call the soil food web. And this is just a, a diagram of that. So we start off with a, uh, a healthy pasture plant here. And we've got um, bacteria living in here. And they get uh, soil organic matter and a bacteria feed on that and a protozoa to feed on the bacteria and the nematodes feed on the protozoa and so forth, all the way to uh, vertebrate animals. And, and we could even include a cow in this soil food web in a pasture system. This is a table that was put together by Ed Rayburn and it's adapted from, from Brady and Weil's soil text. And, and it's really pretty amazing when we start to look at these numbers. This is a um, biomass of organisms above ground and below ground in a pasture ecosystem. So if we, if we concentrate at below ground, we'll see that, that all together, when we add everything up here, we've got seven tons of living things per acre. It's pretty amazing. Think about that. In a healthy pasture ecosystem, 14,000 pounds of living things per acre. We've got bacteria. We've got pasture roots at 2,500 pounds, 2,000 pounds, a ton of bacteria per acre. Think of how many billions of bacteria that is uh, in a healthy acre of soil. We've got a ton of mycetes, which are kind of related to bacteria, another ton of those. We've got three tons of fungi, and, and we've got nematodes, and we've got 620 pounds of earthworms. It's pretty amazing when you think about all the things in a healthy pasture ecosystem. And all those things have a role. First one I want to talk about, and we can't talk about all of them today, but is earthworms. And there's kind of three niches. Remember, there's over 600 pounds of earthworms in a, per acre in a healthy pasture. 
We have ones that kind of dwell on that litter surface layer and they kind of break down that, that residue that's on top of the soil. We've got ones that kind of go below the soil a little bit but stay in the top six inches of soil and they kind of move around side to side and, and they come up and they get residue and they take it back down and incorporate it into the soil and, and they leave these things called worm castings which are digested organic matter. So they're helping to cycle that organic matter that, that we were talking about earlier in the cover crop systems back into the soil and break it down. And then we have ones that move up and down in the soil and they, and they can go several meters down depending on, on the type of soil that you have. And they bring litter from the top down into the soil profile. And they're important in mixing that, that, uh, that soil. So they consume manure, they speed up decomposition of plant residues, they produce those castings that we talked about, that, that manure from the worms. They improve um, structure, infiltration, they create tunnels in the soil, and, uh, and in this photo is actually a shade area in a pasture, and these are actually, these, these aren't from moles, but these are actually from earthworms in this pasture, all these little bumps in this area here where they were breaking down manure that was left underneath the shade structure. Uh, these are some uh, photos of soil bacteria. We have more than a ton of bacteria per acre in a healthy pasture. They are uh, decomposers. They immobilize nutrients in their, their structure. They make energy and nutrients available from things that they consume. We have uh, mutualistic partners with plants like nitrogen fixing bacteria like rhizobium that we would find in, in soybeans, in vetch, in clover, in alfalfa, in lespedezas, form associations with bacteria in which nitrogen is fixed from the air into a plant available form. We have ones that are pathogens and then we have another group called uh, chemoautotrophs which actually use energy sources other than carbon. They can use nitrogen, sulfur, iron, or hydrogen as an energy source in some cases. Some of the services that bacteria provide, they uh, decompose and immobilize nutrients. They can suppress disease. Water movement in the soil, they can help aggregate the soil so water will move into the soil better in a healthy pasture system. And then we have nitrifying bacteria that convert ammonium to nitrite to nitrate, in which the plants actually uh, can take up. And we have um, also what we call free living bacteria or atenomycetes, which can have a, uh, some nitrogen fixation associated with them also. And they decompose, in addition, uh, chitin and cellulose in the soil. So they're helping break down that residual plant material in a pasture ecosystem. So as we mentioned earlier, legumes like clover fix nitrogen from the air and convert it into a plant available form. They do that in conjunction with rhizobium bacteria and they form these nodules on the roots. These nodules are actually where the bacteria are housed. They infect the roots of the plant and, um, and then they fix nitrogen and in return in the symbiotic relationship, they get a carbon source or an energy source from this plant. So they share nitrogen and they get an energy source back in terms of sugars and carbohydrates from that plant. And this is really, really important, not only in pasture ecosystems, but also in cropping systems for things like soybeans. Um, adding legumes tends to increase yields. Uh, they improve forage quality and animal performance. And we can get improved summer growth depending on the legume that we choose. If we choose something with a deep tap root like alfalfa or Cerecia lespedeza, we can get some significant growth during the summer months because they're able to reach water deeper in the soil profile. And for us in the tall fescue area, dilution of the endophyte, it helps improve um, animal performance on infected tall fescue during the summer months. And these are some estimates of, of the amount of nitrogen fixed by different um, legumes. Alfalfa is our most aggressive nitrogen fixer. It can be up to 250 pounds per acre. Annual lespedeza is our least aggressive, somewhere between 50 and 150 pounds per acre. Um, and then there's the monetary value, the worth of that nitrogen. One thing I don't like about this table is that it almost makes like 
putting legumes into a pasture is the same thing as throwing a bag of fertilizer out or a ton of broiler litter on that pasture, and it's not. That nitrogen has to get shared between that legume plant and the grass plant. And, uh, and it's not always directly shared. In most cases, it's indirectly shared. And in a grassland ecosystem, the way that nitrogen gets shared is that the, the ruminant eats that nitrogen, and then it moves through that animal. That animal extracts some of the nitrogen, some of the energy out of that forage, and then it deposits the rest on the pasture as dung and urine. And that's how nitrogen is shared in that, that grassland ecosystem. We also get it shared through death and decomposition of plant parts. So as that leaf from that uh, clover plant falls onto the soil surface or gets smashed into the soil surface by a grazing animal, um, that will decompose and release nutrients uh, into the system. As legumes cycle, go through their life cycle, the nodules sometimes slough off and release nitrogen into the, into the ecosystem also. And as that legume plant dies, that nitrogen gets released into that system. There's really pretty limited direct transfer. So it's not like we've got a grass plant growing here and a legume plant growing here and, and there's a little bridge between them where we get a lot of nitrogen transfer. There are some bridges, but it's not a tremendous amount of nitrogen transfer between the plants and, not, and really not that well understood. So what do we do when we think about incorporating legumes into pastures? We need to think about how, how do we create an environment in which those legumes are going to thrive in pastures. Um, we'd like them to make 20 up to 20 to 30 percent of the sward. And uh, that doesn't sound like a lot, but if you've ever really looked at 30 percent of a, a pasture um, with legumes in it, it looks like a lot of clover at 30 percent. So we lime and fertilize according to soil tests. We adjust that soil pH so that it favors legume growth in our pastures. Generally speaking, legumes tend to like a little higher pH than our grass plants do. So by adjusting that fertility and also that grazing management, we can tend to encourage legumes and grazing systems. Sometimes we need to overseed legumes. Sometimes we don't. Sometimes just changing how we manage grazing can encourage legumes to come out in that stand in that pasture. Sometimes we have to introduce legumes back into a pasture. Uh, four to six pounds of red clover and a one, one or two pounds of white clover um, is a good mixture to overseed pastures with. And I like to do this in February. Uh, it gives the freezing and thawing time to incorporate that seed if we spread it out over that pasture in February. And sometimes we can add a little bit of annual espadiza. That's a warm season annual legume and that provides some summer grazing. And you know, it's going to cost you somewhere, depending on the varieties you buy, between $25 and $30 or $35 per acre. We don't need to do this every year. If we've got a good stand of legume, there's no reason to be overseeding every year. Um, usually, red clover will last anywhere between two and three years. Sometimes it reseeds itself, but not dependably. And then rotationally stocking our pastures is important because we're managing grazing. We're managing uh, the grass plant and the legume together. And depending on how we graze that pasture, how close we graze that pasture, we can favor either the grass or the legume. Generally speaking, if we graze a little bit closer, we tend to put the grass at a disadvantage and allow that legume to become more dominant in that mixture. This is a, a photo of a protozoa right there. It's just kind of a glob. And, and they help with nutrient cycling by feeding on bacteria. So remember, bacteria was breaking down uh, uh, plant material and incorporating those nutrients into the structure of the bacteria. And then those nutrients are released when the protozoa feed on the bacteria. Fungi decompose organic matter. They produce a, a compound called glomulin, which is kind of a sticky compound and then helps develop soil structure in, uh, in, in soil. So we get aggregates of soil. Soils are made up of really small pieces, right? And what an aggregate is, is when those small pieces get stuck together into a, like a little glob almost or an aggregate. And the better the soil structure, the more of these aggregates that we have and the better aeration is in the soil and the better the water infiltration will be. Fungi also extract nutrients. They hold nutrients and prevent losses and, and some will even kill nematodes. And we have, if you remember, about 6,000 pounds of um, 
fungi per acre in a healthy pasture. This is actually an electron micrograph of a nematode, and there's a, a fungi that has almost like a noose around that nematode and um, is getting ready to, to prey upon that nematode. Um, a, a special type of uh, organism is called a mycorrhizae, and this is a vesicular or muscular mycorrhizae. And this is, essentially increases contact with the soil. So it infects the plant root and then it grows out. So it's like it's almost increasing the size of the plant root system as, um, as it infects this plant. And then it transfers things like phosphorus and water back into that plant. This is very interesting. In low phosphorus soils, plants tend to be um, infected with this vesicular muscular mycorrhizae and it helps that plant cope with that low phosphorus stress. Um, and there is a little bit of evidence showing that it could be a mechanism of nitrogen transfer between grasses and legumes and mixtures. This is a ectomycorrhizae, and this works on the outside of the plant roots, and this is very important in forest systems. Um, this actually helps a pine tree in a pine plantation, which is usually in very low phosphorus soils, uh, deal with that low phosphorus by infecting the roots and letting it find more phosphorus within that soil. I want to talk just a little bit about anthropods or insects and their relatives. And this is actually uh, taken underneath a microscope and this is um, insects that were washed out of a soil sample. These are very, very small insects, but there's lots of insects that we can't even see with the naked eye and some that we can't even see with the microscope that they're so small we have to use a special microscope called an electron microscope to see. And these are some photos, these black and white ones with the electron microscope. Tons of different anthropods. A lot have never even been identified. But we've got ants and we've got springtails and we've got centipedes and millipedes and dung beetles and, and so forth. And they all serve as a role in this whole nutrient cycling within grazing systems. So professions in high demand, welders, computer programmers, fitter and, and turners, plumbers, and dung beetles. So dung beetles are an important part of the healthy pasture ecosystem. And, and I, would, I would encourage you, if, if you've never really looked for dung beetles in your pasture, go home and, and take a look. They're, they're most active at higher temperatures. So um, in the spring, after things warm up, you'll be able to see them in manure patch that are maybe a day old or so. And, and they play an important role because they take that manure and they actually incorporate it back into the soil. And, uh, and we have three different niches here. We have what we call the tunnelers and they actually dig a pretty deep tunnel down into the soil and deposit what we call a brood ball. And that's actually a ball of manure with an with a, um, egg in it. And then that egg develops and produces another dung beetle. We've got dwellers, they kind of live in the manure pat or just right below the soil surface, below that um, manure pat. And then we have what we call the rollers. These are not as prevalent here in this part of the country. We see a lot of these in, in Africa. Most of the videos that you see are, are from uh, Africa, these, of these rollers. And they actually will roll a ball across the soil and then bury it, that uh, brood ball of dung with their egg on it. So they, they are helpful in nutrient cycling, may reduce pests and parasites by breaking manure paths down, reduce volatilization of manure, bring food to soil microbes. So they make this brood ball, lay an egg in it, and then bury it in the soil. Well, the larvae consumes about half of that, and then the rest of that manure ball is actually available for other microbes to break down within the soil. And they can improve soil structure. This is an estimate from the University of Texas of, of what the monetary value of dung beetles are. And it's pretty big, but everything in Texas is big, I guess. And this is about, they estimate in this particular paper, $2, two billion annually. I don't know exactly how they came up with that number, but it seems pretty big to me. I think a more, a more reasonable estimate would be about three, $380 million a year is what the uh, value of the dung beetle services are. Um, in terms of pasture ecosystems. And if you ever wondered what a dung beetle gets at the drive through it's number two. <laughs> All right. We, um, 
as I said earlier, we, all, we often think of slugs and snails as, as detrimental in, in cropping systems, and, and certainly sometimes they are. There's no question about that. But they also play an important role in the eco, pasture ecosystem. They tend to be shredders, and they, they break bigger material up so that other things can decompose that material. So they may take a plant leaf and they kind of shred it up, and they get some nutrients out of it, and then those smaller pieces can be consumed by fungi and bacteria in that in that ecosystem. And they can be predators of, of, of other things also. This is all, one that I always find interesting is nematodes. Nematodes are microscopic worms in the soil. And the only thing we ever hear about nematodes is how bad they are. Soybean cyst nematode. We hear about tobacco cyst nematode, how, how bad they are in cropping systems. And they can certainly be bad, but there's also other free living nematodes in the soil. Um, there's ones that feed on bacteria. Remember we said that bacteria can break things down and then immobilize those nutrients in their structure? Well, these nematodes can actually uh, feed on that bacteria and release those nutrients back into the system to be used by the plant. We have uh, nematodes that feed on fungus. We have ones that are predatory, so they eat other nematodes and protozoa. We have omnivores that eat a variety of organisms. Um, or, or even may have different diet at different stages of its life. And then we have the, the ones that are parasitic to plants, root feeding nematodes um, that we try to kill. And, and it always drives me crazy when we try to kill these in cropping systems because, uh, for example, in tobacco, we'll use something like, uh, what's the chemical called? Where we gas the soil. Well, we're trying to kill the, the nematodes, but guess what else we kill? Every, every other living thing in that soil, right? So, all right, so let's just look at a nutrient cycle, and this is a simplified example, but we start with the sun. We got a plant that grows. We've got a, a plant that gets eaten by an herbivore like a cow or a sheep or a goat, and then we have manure and urine excreted onto the soil surface. And then we have shredders that come in, like those snails and the worms and, and so forth, that kind of break up and reduce the particle size. And then we have bacteria that consume uh, very degradable carbohydrates. And we've got fungus in the tenomycetes that break down less degradable carbohydrates, like uh, cell walls, like the physical part of the plant, like the stem and the leaves and so forth. And they release macro and micro nutrients that uh, can be used by the plant, and the plant grows again, and the whole cycle starts over. It's a pretty amazing cycle when you think about that. You know, one of the most sustainable agricultural systems is a well-managed grassland ecosystem. We remove very few nutrients from that system, and they're recycled around this system with good management. So let's just take a couple minutes and talk about uh, managing nutrient cycles in grasslands. You know, probably the single most important nutrient in, in managing grassland ecosystems is lime because it, soil pH impacts nutrient availability. And, and that's what this graph is showing. Basically, the wider that band is for a given nutrient, the more plant available it is. The smaller that band is, the less plant available nutrient, less plant available it is. So, um, when we look at where we want to be in terms of pH for a pasture, we want to be somewhere between 6 and 7. That's when all of our macronutrients are going to be at their maximum availability in that system. And that's good for the plant, but it's also good for everything else that lives in the soil because everything else needs nutrients also. So the more available those nutrients are within that system, the better it's going to be for those microorganisms living in that soil also. When we look at nutrient removal in a cow-calf system, we have inputs that come into this system. Maybe we use some fertilizer, maybe we put manure back on that pasture. Uh, we've got legumes bringing nitrogen into the system. Maybe we feed a little bit of hay or a little bit of concentrate. All those things are bringing nutrients into this system. And they get cycled around this system, as we talked about earlier. And then we have exports. And, and basically, in a cow-calf system, our export is a calf. And um, if we look at what a cow-calf pair removes in a, in a season, they remove about 10 pounds of nitrogen, 7 pounds of P2O5 or phosphate, and a pound of potassium. So just, just think about that for one minute. 
that's not a lot of nutrients being taken out of that system. And that's what makes grassland systems so sustainable. Um, and then we put this on, say, two to three acres per cow-calf pair. Nutrient removal is very, very low on an acre basis in a cow-calf system. All right, what grazing can do, it can redistribute nutrients within a pasture. So, for example, we got a big boundary here, and, and our animals go out and they graze out here, and then they come back and they kind of lounge around our water source, which is a pond in this case, and, and around the shade source, which are both nutrient magnets, we say. And, and they relax and they ruminate and everything's going good, and they go to get up to go back out and graze again, and what happens? That's right, they, they have a... Uh, bowel movement and deposit dung and urine. And over time, what happens is that we take nutrients from here in the grass through the cow and we redeposit them around our water and shade sources, maybe our mineral feeders and so forth. So, so the question is, is what, what do we do about that? We can actually tell if, we, if you ever do a um, grid sampling of a pasture, you can tell where people feed hay because there'll be a nutrient concentration there. And um, and those are all nutrient magnets, magnets. So what we do is we subdivide, we add some water sources, and we rotate around these pastures. The smaller we make these subdivisions, the more even the nutrient distribution is going to be within that subdivision. So instead of being able to graze here and then deposit nutrients here, we're saying, no, you got to stay in here and deposit your nutrients where you got them from. And that's really going to help with, with nutrient distribution within the pasture. This is from the Missouri Grazing Manual, and, um, and what we have here is, is a one paddock of a three paddock rotation, then we have one paddock of a 24 paddock rotation. And basically, the darker the, the gradation, the, the more dung pats in that area. This is water here, water here. So as you can see, in the, this larger paddock, lots of manure piles were being transferred around the water, but not so much out here. In a smaller paddock, we had a much more even distribution of dung piles over the entire pasture area. I just want to touch on nutrients removed by hay, and I know everybody in this room realizes this, but when we cut hay versus grazing, we remove a lot of nutrients in that hay. If we take orchard grass, for example, we're removing about 50 pounds of nitrogen per ton, 15 pounds of uh, P205, and about 60 pounds of potash. So say you had a good year and you got three tons per acre. Well, if you do the math, you took 150 pounds of nitrogen out of that field, you took 45, 50 pounds of, of potash, uh, phosphate and about 180 pounds of potash out of that field. You can do that a few times, but long term, you've got to replace those nutrients back in that field or else you're going to draw it down. It's like taking money out of your bank account and never putting any in. So it's very, very important to replace nutrients that remove in hay. And you can do that multiple ways. You could feed that hay back on that, pasture, that hay field where you took it off of, or you get commercial fertilizer or broiler litter and bring those nutrients back into that system. So if we look at the value of nutrients in, in a ton of hay, and I, I had to make some assumptions here, and that, those are the assumptions. One ton of hay is going to have somewhere between $60 and $70 worth of nutrients in it. Just think about that for one minute. 60 to $70 of, of nutrients. What can you buy a bale of hay for? I mean, I, I don't have this slide in here, but you know, if you go to the hay clearinghouse, you can get a round bale for, I don't know, $20, $30, And uh, say there's three round bales in there, that guy's barely covering his nutrient costs that he removed from there, let alone any machinery costs and labor for making that hay. So. It's, it's important to know what the value of those nutrients are in each ton of hay that you take off of that pasture. As far as hay feeding goes, you know, anything that you can do to, to help um, spread those nutrients out over that pasture area is better. A lot of times the easiest place to feed hay is where? Ne next to a barn or next to a gate in a pasture just throw it out there and we feed hay there all winter long, they muck it all up. Next thing you know, you got a huge nutrient concentration right there. You're much better off if you can roll that hay out and spread out, spread those nutrients out. 
The other thing you can do with hay feeding is you can move nutrients within or even outside of a grazing system. So what I mean by that is like, say you were on an old dairy farm, where's the easiest place to spread manure on a dairy farm? Two miles down the road or right beside the barn? Close. close, yeah, exactly. So generally speaking, if you have fields close to a, uh, where they used to milk at, they're gonna be pretty high in phosphorus, right? And uh, you could actually make hay there and then move that hay and feed them on fields that are low in fertility away from uh, the hay fields and actually move nutrients around that system in that manner. And you can also buy hay, feed hay, and bring nutrients into a grazing system also. Sometimes you get some weeds when you buy hay and sometimes it's not easy to get good hay. Sometimes you, you have to really shop around to find good hay. All right. And we talked about moving feeding points around. So whether you're feeding with a bale wagon or a unrolling hay or moving rings, just move those feeding points around so you get a more even distribution of, of nutrients within that grazing system. All right, looking at healthy soil ecology, food supply is important. Um, we need organic matter in that system, and that organic matter provides not only food for microorganisms, but also habitat. Um, physical environment or habitat at all scales. We think of habitat, say we think of deer habitat, what do we think of? Think of woods, right? Or some kind of timbered area where they have habitat. The same thing happens at a micro scale for microorganisms in the soil. We create or, or destroy habitat by how we manage that grazing in the pasture. If we graze that, uh, pasture down the soil surface all the time, there is no habitat there for those animals and there's no food source because we didn't leave any carbon or organic matter near the soil surface. Um, diversity is good. Diversity of consumers and, and um, producers and omnivores and predators and predators of predators is, is all good to have within this healthy grassland ecosystem. And then our chemical environment. So, so soil oxygen, that means we don't compact our soils. We want good aeration in the soil so that the microorganisms can live in that soil. We want good pH. We want that six to seven. We want nutrient, good nutrient availability within that soil. And then um, Wade was talking about the thermal environment and cover crops, you know, how, how that impacts it. How we manage that residual grazing after we're, uh, the res residual plant material after we graze through a pasture is really important because we're modifying that microclimate. We can change the temperature near the soil surface by grazing it one inch versus three inches or one inch versus four inches. Um, we can also help shade that soil surface and reduce soil moisture losses during the summertime. And that all impacts those mic microbial populations within the soil. So, Maintain our soil pH at around six to seven. Adequate but not excessive nutrients in the system. Manage nutrient flows in the farm. Recycle manure, urine, water, residues. Um, and that uh, works with good grazing management. And give that land, when we graze our pastures, we need to leave a good residual height within that pasture. We don't want to graze it down to the soil surface. And we need to rest that pasture pasture between grazing events. Don't graze too closely or too frequently. Remember, we want to maintain some habitat for other things in the pasture. Incorporate legumes when we can into that grazing system to bring nitrogen into that system. Um, and, and, that, and legumes are not only preferred by livestock, but also earthworms, interestingly enough, tend to prefer clover over grasses. Use a dung beetle friendly wormer. There's a lot of wormers out there. Moxidectin is the only one that I know of that has on their label uh, uh, that they're dung beetle friendly. And um, when we talk about weed control in pastures, I think it's important that, that we always use an integrated approach to weed control in pastures. And, and row crops is different. I mean, we're trying to kill everything in a row crop except for that row crop plant itself. In a pasture, we don't want to do that. 
we want to maintain legumes and grasses together, and that's a really hard mixture to find a herbicide that's going to kill a weed but not a legume plant. And, and so by maintaining a healthy and vigorous sod through good management, um, we can exclude a lot of weeds from that pasture. Sometimes we'll have to use herbicides, but herbicides shouldn't always be the go-to plan in terms of weed control and pastures. The big message that I want you to take home today is that, that when we manage grassland ecosystems, we're managing much more than, than a cow in a grass plant. We're managing all these things that we've been talking about, soil microbes and earthworms and everything else that's in a pasture. Um, so it's really important to think about that as we uh, incorporate management into our grazing systems. And this is the most important part of a, a grazing system. Not the earthworm and not the bacteria and not the dung beetle and not the cow, but, but you as managers is the most important part. Everything that you do is going to impact everything else within that grazing system. So, so this is probably the single most important part. These are some additional resources that you can use, and um, if you're interested in these, I'll, I'll let you know. This is a really good website. Um, it's called the Soil Biology Primer, and you can download this online. It's a PDF file, and that's a really good overview of, of all these organisms in, in their roles they play within a healthy grassland ecosystem. And with that, I would be happy to answer any questions. Mm -hmm. Right down below it says when it says native pasture. What is the definition of a native pasture? <laughs> That's a great question. I, and so the definition of a native pasture, I, I always call that a, a, something that would be a mixture of um, tall, tall fescue, yeah, crabgrass, wiregrass, maybe a little white clover in it maybe a little less bediza, would be what I would call a native pasture. Any better definitions than that? The what? Unmanaged. Unmanaged pasture. That's probably even better definition, Keith. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Any other questions? Don't ask me a question about them because I don't know anything. I'm just a forage guy. <laughs> I guess David Holzhauser, or maybe Keith would be a good one. Keith's a big row crop guy. <laughs> but our soybean guy would be good to ask. I'll find what you want to spot, but you it up. All right, yes. In your opinion. I don't know. I'd like to leave about. I mean, you heard it by grazing it down pretty hard the winter and then not touching it again until spring? No, I, I don't. So, like in a stockpiling situation. Yeah. So, say we stockpile tall grazing fescue. It's something I'm not really stockpiling, but it's my grass. I'm finishing up now. I'm yeah. Last rotation through, I'm finishing up. I'm grazing it down. I'm not going to touch it again until spring. Yeah. You heard it by grazing it down? So I, I think this time of year, you're not going to hurt it too much by grazing it down close. I think it would hurt more a little bit earlier in fall when, when that plant would start still be actively regrowing. So it would mobilize carbohydrates in the plant to kind of fuel that regrowth. And then before it had a chance to recharge those carbohydrates, it would get frosted. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't think it's that big of an issue uh, to graze a little bit closer right now. And as you, as you gray stockpile tall fescue, which is the cheapest way to overwinter a cow in Virginia, um, you know, you can graze that pretty tight. And that's actually a management practice is to graze it tight and then overseed with clover if you need clover in that mixed stand. Any other questions? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, in February. 
You just mix them together and throw them out together. Yeah, and and you know, there's an art to overseeding legumes in the pastures. And the only time I'll ever tell you to really abuse a pasture is if you want to overseed legumes in it. You want to graze it tight to get to get, open that stand up to let that seed get to the soil surface. And ideally, if you could drag it as you're as you're overseeding it and just get a little bit of soil. I'm not talking deep tillage or anything. Just a pasture drag to scratch a little bit of soil up and get that seed incorporated with the soil. That's going to be a, a positive thing. Keith. Yeah, that's ideal. I mean, really, when you're when you're one of the reasons um, frost seedings where we throw the the seed out in February and let the freezing and thawing incorporate in the soil. One of the reasons they fail is in the spring is that the growth from the sod. So those plants that are in that pasture already grows up around those little seedlings that are trying to get established. So ideally, Keith. You throw this, put the seed in, and put animals in that pasture, and just let them keep everything grazed down close uh, until those seedlings get up to a height where the animals are actually starting to graze them off. Then you just pull the animals off and let them become established. But a lot of failures are related to not controlling that vegetation after we frost seed. This is worse than the soybean nematode question. <laughs> and if you rotate, you know, even if you have it in the alfalfa field, it's about that tall by the time the alfalfa is up to Well, I, I will say that normally where we don't see Johnson grass at is in a pasture. Yeah. And, and why is that? Because it, it tastes pretty good. Yeah, so animals will graze it out of a, of a continuous pasture. Now, when we start to implement rotational stocking, all of a sudden, Johnson grass tends to thrive under that kind of management. Yeah, and in hay fields, I remember, um, I know there's somebody from the Department of Corrections here, but I'll say this anyways. The, uh, they've got a field that's pretty bad with Johnson grass at one of the farms, and uh, in, they wanted to kill the Johnson grass, and, and uh, the question is, is, is how do we kill it? And Johnson grass is tough. I mean, you can kill it. You really have to put it in a row crop for several years and apply glyphosate to it to get it under control. And then you can go back into a pasture or a hay field situation. But the problem is, is that seed's still in the soil. So it's going to come back eventually. Sometimes I think, yeah, boy, just put your hands up and surrender to it and, uh, and start to manage it as a warm season grass for in a hay system. And, and that's not a Virginia Tech answer, of course. <laughs> the Virginia Tech answer is that Johnson grass is a noxious weed. I think we need to start some research on that and try to feed it and properly care it. And that's what I'm saying. Yeah. If you look in Southern Forage's book, which is the kind of the forage Bible for this part of the country, it's listed as a forage crop in that book. And if you go further south into Mississippi and Louisiana, it's managed as a forage crop in those states. Yeah. All right. Any other questions? Thank you very much for your attention. I appreciate it.